That's our prayer. That's our desire. Come on, somebody. Let's say, I'm going to glorify his name. No one else can glorify his name for you. You must do that for yourself. Amen. Make up your mind. Say, I I want to glorify his name. I'm going to glorify his name. He's worthy of the praise. God is a provider. He's our protector. He's who we depend upon. So Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time we have. Put your hands together one more time as we glorify his name. You may be seated for a moment today. It is an honor to be with you at Apostolic Pentecostal Church. Seems people here that I know, people here that I've met. Amen. This church has a great place that's standing at United Pentecostal Church. Brother Adam Dennis and I this week, I mentioned we were talking. He gave me some of the history that I did not know the role this church has played, especially your pastor, Brother Williford, his wife, and what they mean to our organization, serving on the journal board for so many years, our general conference on a national basis and things he's been involved in and what this church really means. So my wife and I are honored to be here with you today. Amen. Good to be with you. Amen. I'm looking forward to what God is going to do in this service. You know, the Lord always answers your heart's prayer desires that you have. You know, I had a great morning this morning except for um, one thing. I didn't have any coffee this morning. And so in between services, I had a deep desire for coffee, and the Lord answered my prayer request first, but then he had something better for me. Brother Reaver said, man, pour that out. I got some community coffee for you. So, Brother Weaver, we're better friends now than we were, you know, in the first service. You know, the Lord provided that community coffee. That, that always hits the spot. But like we mentioned, it's good to be here, and I appreciate your pastor's vision. This church has been a lot to North American missions over the years. You've always been a top supporter, not just in your district, but also nationally in Christmas for Christ. And you know, this district is a special district to us at North American Mission, not just because we're, hit, we're here in St. Louis, but James Sample, who was your long-serving North American Mission director, almost 30 years he served to North American Missions. You know, last year in our Christmas of Christ season, I heard from Brother Sample more than from any other director in the country and brother sample told me he says i'm going to set a record offering this year and he and i we never talked about the fact that he knew it was more than likely going to be his last year serving as north american missions director barring a miracle he knew his days here on the earth were short but at the end of cfc season i got a phone call from brother sample and his sickness had gotten to a point when he could barely talk could barely talk in more than a whisper but he was so proud to tell me. So, Brother Stewart, I did it. Amen. Missouri set another record offering for Christmas for Christ. But it just shows you his heart's desire. Bert, even when his days on this earth were short, he wanted to make sure that Missouri District and this church has played a great role in the success of the offerings that's happened at Christmas for Christ in the Missouri District. 1966 was the first year that Home Missions Division started the Christmas for Christ offering. That year, the offering raised was $103,000, which at that time was a great amount of money. The year before, at General Conference in 1965, there was a commitment to start 27 churches up and down the East Coast of the United States of America with no money to fund those churches. And that first year, Christmas for Christ, the $103,000 went to fund those churches. Uh, but I'm here to tell you today that since then, over $102 million uh, has been raised for Christmas for Christ. Uh, and that's what we use in North American missions uh, to grow around the country and plant new church for the kingdom of God. And so we thank Thank you for your support. We thank you for your vision. And we know that God is going to speak to you to give another record offering here at APC this year. Second Kings chapter 4, beginning in verse number 8, will be our key verse for today. If we'll stand together in honor of the reading of the word. Second Kings chapter 4, in verse 8. And the Bible says, And it fell on a day that Elisha passed to Shunem, for it was a great woman, and she constrained him to eat bread. And so it was that as oft as he passed by, 
he turned him thither to eat bread. And she said unto her husband, Behold, now I perceive that this is an holy man of God, which passes by us continually. Let us make a little chamber, I pray thee, on the wall. Let us set for him there a bed and a table and a stool and a candlestick. And it shall be, when he cometh to us, that he shall turn him thither. And it fell on a day that he came thither, and he turned to the chamber and lay there. And for a few moments, I'm going to preach on the topic of, if you build it, he will come. Let's bow our heads as we pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, Lord. Quicken your word to our hearts and to our minds. As your word goes forth in your presence and glory, let it go before right now, Father. Let us be prepared to receive a word and a harvest from you. And let your will be done. We thank you and we praise you today for your greatness to us in Jesus. They put your hands together one more time as you're seated. Amen. We thank God for his presence today. You may be seated. They say the first rule of development is if you build it, they will come. So I travel in many different parts of the country. It look like our country is becoming the same everywhere. I can drive down an interstate and I can look at an exit coming up and I can see the sign for the Bank of America, for the Walmart, for the grocery store of that particular region, for the Home Depot, and I can pretty much get off on that exit and drive in either direction and know I'm going to find a Dunkin' Donuts or a Starbucks or what's going to be around the corner. Amen. It always amazes me that you go through a part of the country where they're building a Bank of America or they're building a grocery store and they're building a Home Depot in the middle of nowhere, and you wonder, why would they put that out here? But you come back just six months later and there's thousands of homes and there's a mall being built because the developers know you know, we build it, people are going to show up. Uh, but I didn't come to you to speak about development. Uh, I come to you to tell you that if you decide to build a place for God in your life, God always shows up. Because in the beginning, God made man for one reason, and that was to have fellowship. And when God made man to have fellowship, he put a soul inside of man that nothing else can fill but God. You know, I have a respectable shoe size for a man. I wear a size 10 and a half shoe. So that's pretty much in the normal range. Uh, but my father wa wears a size 13 shoe wide. And sometimes my dad would be at my house, uh, and I want to run out to the mailbox to get some. His shoes are by the door. I just slip my feet in his shoes, and I feel like a five-year-old kid wearing daddy's shoes again. Like, man, I'm never going to be able to feel these shoes. I'm a grown man now. And I put on my dad's shoes, and I feel like a little kid again. And that's how it is in your life when there's a hole inside of you that's big enough for God. Uh, when there's a hole inside of you that's big enough for God, amen. Money is not going to fill it. Uh, drugs is not going to fill it. Uh, the world is not going to fill it. Uh, Politics is not going to fill it. All that can fill the hole inside of you is God himself. So there's a place inside of you that God designed for him to fit. Uh, and you must make up your mind to say, I'm going to build a place for God. Uh, I'm going to build a place for God in my life. Uh, I'm going to build a place for God in my family. I'm going to build a place for God in my marriage. Uh, I'm going to build a place for God in my business. I'm going to build a place for God at my school. Uh, I'm going to build a place for God in my neighborhood. Because one thing I know, if you build build it, he will come. God's looking for that place to fellowship and that place to show up and that place to be strong in your behalf. But this lady we read about, she noticed something. The man of God was passing by her house. Uh, and, you know, he wasn't the only traveler. He wasn't the only person. Uh, but there was something she noticed that this is a man of God. Uh, and there's something supposed to be different about us. Uh, that when we go to work, when we go to school, there's just something the world can't put its finger on. But there's something different about you. And she began to tell the man of God, anytime you're passing by, just stop in and eat bread with me and my husband. Uh, and you know, bread always signifies uh, the word of God. Uh, and if you're going to build a place for God in your life, uh, there must be a place for the word of God in your life. 
The only time you read the scriptures on a Sunday morning, that's a major problem. Uh, you've got to spend time in the word. Uh, you've got to love the word. Uh, you've got to know the word. Uh, your kids should spend time in the word with you. You've got to love the word of God. But something began to happen. And she said, this man of God is passing us by continually. Uh, we enjoy him coming to break bread with us. Uh, we enjoy him coming, telling about the latest miracle. We enjoy him coming, amen, telling us about the word of God. But she told her husband, said, honey, we must build a room for him. Uh, we must build a place for him. Uh, let me tell you something. The more time you spend in the word, the more time you want to spend in the word. Uh, the more time you spend with God, the more time you want to spend with God. People don't understand why do we go to church so much? Uh, because we desire that deeper relationship. Uh, we're not satisfied with a passing by experience, uh, an occasional experience, but we want to have that place for God. But I ask you today, is there a place in your life for God? God's not trying to fit on your overcrowded, messy desk or bed. Uh, God's not trying to fit in between binge watching your native show on Netflix. Uh, God's not trying to make it easy for you, amen, to make room for him. God demands that you must make room. You must make space. Uh, you must build a place for God. I am convinced that the devil has found it easier to keep apostolics busy than to make apostolic sin. But at the end of the day, the devil doesn't care what keeps you from doing the will and work of God. If it's sin or if it's your schedule, we have time for the kids' baseball and soccer practice, but no time to bring them to youth group. Uh, we have time to build our career and build our business, but no time for prayer meeting. Uh, we have overscheduled ourselves to the point that we have no time and place for God. I wonder sometimes about this woman that built the room because the Bible says she was barren. And in the Bible days, they did not understand when a woman did not have kids, uh, amen, what the medical reasons may be. They assumed uh, that she was cursed. Uh, and sometimes I've wondered if she had a house full of kids, uh, if she had the next grandchild on the way, would she have had time or see the need to build a room for God? Uh, she may have been so busy adding a nursery and building a playroom that occupied all her time, uh, but perhaps uh, it was her lack uh, and her barrenness uh, that drove her to the place uh, to make time in a room for God. And sometimes it's your lack. It's your pain. It's your barrenness. I've heard it said that God whispers to us in our pleasure, but shouts to us in our pain. And sometimes uh, it takes that barrenness to drive us to our knees to build that room for God. But you say, honey, when we build this wall, we must build it. Build this room. We must build it on the wall. Because in the Bible days, homes uh, had a rooftop with a wall around it. Uh, that was the most visible part of their home. Uh, you know what she was saying? Uh, we're not going to put the room in the basement. Uh, we're not going to put the room around back. Uh, I don't want people to guess what we're doing. I want it to be known up front. I'm building a room for God. Uh, God doesn't have time for secret Christians. Uh, amen. When you build a place for God, it must be on the wall. And see, by placing it on the wall, it was a very vulnerable place. Uh, the reason they had a wall was to keep others out. Uh, and sometimes in your life, uh, we build walls that the pastor can't get through. We build walls that God himself cannot get through. But when you build a room for God, it must be on the wall. It must be there visible. It must be there where God can get in and do the work only God can do. Because once they built the place for the man of God, the Bible says that we came there one day and he lay there. Because there's a difference when you have a place uh, that is built for you. You see, because before they built a place, uh, amen, he could only come when he was invited. Because uh, there were times uh, he would walk by and they were not on the front porch. Uh, he would just keep walking. Uh, but now, because they built a room for him, uh, he had his own key. He had his own room. He could just come anytime. See, you build a place for God and God. God can just show up. 
There were times they would go to town to do some shopping uh, and come back home and much to their surprise, there would be a chariot out front and they would say, we did not know the man of God was coming today, but he was home before we even got back. Uh, and sometimes uh, in your life, you need God to be there before you know you need God to be there. Something just happened and you don't have time to even go to your knees, but God is already there. God has already shown up because you built a room for God, God was there already. And when you build a room for God, it's a place that God can work for him. You know, when I go to Houston, uh, man, where my brother lives, uh, and I have a trip or a meeting there, you know what I say? Amen. I can stay here, uh, and I can stay longer, and I can drive to where I need to go, because why? I got a place where I can stay. Uh, and when you build a room for God, that becomes God's headquarters. Uh, in your neighborhood, you build a room for God. God says, guess what? When I get ready to reach his apartment complex, to reach the sub division. I got a room right here. I got a place where I can show up and I can work for them. Young people wrote me by within your school. What well, builds a room for God right there in the school, right there at that desk, right there in that classroom and say, God, when you get ready, you can come right here. Problems in your marriage, you know why? You haven't built room for God in the marriage. You got room for everything else, but God uh, builds a room for God in your family. So when God gets ready to work, he's got a place to work from. The scripture says that a man's gift will make room for him. I propose to you today that the room you build for God makes room for your gifts. Some of you wondering, when's the pastor going to let me preach? When's the pastor going to let me teach? When's the pastor going to let me sing? Just build a room for God. When you build a room for God, it becomes a place where your gifts can operate from. You say, but pastor, I want to build a room for God. But how do I know that God has moved in? There's four things that must be in the room. She told her husband, we're not just going to build a room, but first, there's got to be a bed in the room. A bed is a place for God to lay. A bed is a place for God to rest. Because if I come to your house and you say, Brother Stewart, stay as long as you want to, and I walk in the guest room and the only piece of furniture is a chair like this, well, I'm not going to stay too long. I'm not going to be spending the night because I can't get comfortable. But sometimes in our lives, we don't give God a place to live. We don't give God a place to stay, a permanent place to reside. Amen. And God is saying, do I have a bed to lay on? Can I I stay a while? Uh, can I stay all night if I want to? Can I stay all day? Can I be here next week? Is there a bed in there? Is there a place you've made that God can live in your life? Second thing, she told her husband, there must be a table there because a table signifies not just a place to feed, but a place for fellowship. You know, when my wife and I got married, had our first daughter, she told me something that sounded strange to me. She said, what time is going to be dinner time? My wife was raised in a home where her parents went to work together, came home at the same time, sat around and had family dinner every night. I was raised in a home with nine kids. Our table wasn't big enough for 11 people. So dinner time was between like 6 and 10 o'clock. There'd be food on the stove. You just made a plate when you got hungry. So I said, what's dinner time? Wife, oh, we, you got to be home from work at a certain time. We got to sit down as a family and we have to eat. But guess what? I learned to look forward to that dinner time because I could talk to the kids. How was your day in school? Uh, and we could catch up and see what's going on. I know today, dinner time, you just stay on Facebook or on your phone. Nobody talks to each other anymore. But in the old days, we had dinner time, and we'd actually talk to each other and make eye contact. And in your life, God needs a place where he can sit down with you, where he can feed you and have fellowship with you. See, God don't have an express lane. That's how we want to treat God. Say, God, I'm running late this morning. I got to go to work in a few minutes. Amen. So I got 10 requests or less. So God, fix this, do this, heal this, do this, and I'll talk to you this evening. God says, sit down, slow down, buddy. You got to spend some time with me. Uh, we got to talk to each other. I need to feed you. I need a table where we can fellowship. Third thing in the room said, let's put a stool in there. What does that stool represent? That stool is a throne, amen, that God can rule from. Uh, I know it don't happen here at APC. When I pastored in Tampa, so many people want to tell me what they need God to do for them. And I'm like, honey, let me tell you what God needs you to do first. 
But let's be a stool in your life that God can sit and God can rule and God can tell you what to do. Growing up, my dad had a chair. And nobody sat in dad's chair, uh, but dad could sit in that chair and watch miracles happen. Rooms would get clean and dishes get washed and grass gets cut. You say, what, what was he doing? He would sit in that chair and he would tell the entire house, this is what you're going to do. And in your life, does God have a stool? Does God have a throne? Does God have a place? to speak to you. I'm talking about when things aren't going your way. I'm talking about when all hell is breaking loose in your life. I'm talking about when nothing is going like you want it to go and the past you actually do something you don't want to do. Is there a place that God can sit and tell you what to do? And the fourth thing was a candlestick it must be light because light does two things. Light gives you light and light gives light to others. We are called to be a witness. The Bible says we overcome the devil by the word of our testimony. That's why the devil fights us so much on our lifestyle and our separation from the world. He doesn't want us to be the light that God has called us to be. But when you put a light in that room, the light will help show you the way. The Bible says thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. So that light will serve as a light to you and a light to others, but you must build a room for God and put a bed in there, put a table in there, put a stool in there, and put some light in there. When you build a room for God, God is no respect of persons. Amen. All Jacob had was a pile of stones for a pillow, and God showed up on a ladder from heaven. Amen. All Abraham had was an altar. He built a sacrifice and killed his son Isaac, and a ram showed up in the thicket in that moment of sacrifice. The first tabernacle was merely built with tents. That's all they had, but God showed up in the Holy of Holies. It don't matter what you have. It don't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter what you've been through, it doesn't matter because when you build a place for God, God will show up. Let's put the first slide on the screen. Uh, you look at this picture that's on the screen, uh, and it may not mean anything to you, uh, but this is Tabernacle of Hope uh, that 13 years ago that God called my wife and I to plant in the inner city of Tampa, and right here on this street corner in Tampa was one of the worst street corners in town. There was drug deals there all day long, prostitution. Uh, I can't tell you how many times there have been stabbings in the parking lot, and you come out and there's blood down there. One time we're having a men's meeting was a drive-by shooting and a guy was laying out there in the parking lot when I came out that got shot uh, and people would tell me that new Tampa Why would you want to put a church there? Aren't you scared? And I said scared is the safest place in town Police are here 24 7 every time I come to the church. I, I got more than one. I'm, it's like 24 hour free security I felt safe when I went the police were always there, but guess what started to happen after a few years I saw the cops left often. I saw the drug dealers left often. I didn't see the other things anymore. You know why? Because when you build a place for God and God shows up, it don't matter what part of town it is. It don't matter what the enemy says. When you build a place for God and God shows up, miracles begin to happen. Look at the next slide. It's one of our church planners that was renting this building, and he could buy it for $120,000. Not only did they not have $120,000, they didn't have the money for the down payment. He asked his church members to go to work and ask their bosses for money. And a lady that worked for a pool company thought perhaps her boss might have enough money just to help with the deposit. She asked her boss for a donation, and the boss said, well, how much is it? And she told him the amount of the deposit. He said, no, how much does the building cost? She said, $120,000. And standing right there in her office, he wrote a check to her church for $120,000. And said, take it to your pastor and go buy this building. And why is that? Someone decides, I'm going to build a room for God. And when I build a room for God things happen. The next slide, uh, you're not going to recognize this, uh, but this is the University of Central Florida that that campus has the highest number of students uh, amen, in the United States of America, almost 70,000 students, uh, amen, and my daughters just graduated from there last year, but five years ago when they went to college, uh, they found out, amen, there was not an apostolic group meeting on that campus, uh, and they decided to find, uh, to start a CMI 
CMI chapter. There's a close connection between CMI and church planners. Uh, my girls are growing up in a church planner's home. Uh, and when you go to start a CMI campus on our colleges that are full of sin, uh, full of paganism, full of those that mock God, it's just like planting a church. Uh, but you can build a room for God right there on a college campus, right there in a junior high school P7 club in a high school. You can build a room for God anywhere. We're going to look at the next slide. Uh, they started having worship nights on the mall in the middle of campus and people got the Holy Ghost right there on the mall. You see a picture of someone getting baptized. And why is that? Because you build a room for God. And God can show up. The next slide. Most of you won't recognize what this building is. It's big enough to be a convention center, civic center in some city. Over 100,000 square feet building. This is New Life in Austin that was started by Bishop David K. Bernard, now pastored by Pastor Rodney Shaw. Beautiful building, over 100,000 square feet. But go to the next slide. You know what this is? This is April 5th, 1992. The first Sunday the New Life Austin met in the Bernard's living room. You can see in the rear of that picture, Connie Bernard on the keyboard. To the left of that picture is David Bernard speaking his first message. And in their living room, you see a place to sit. You see a table. You see some chairs. And you know what happened? When David Bernard decided to go to Austin and build a room for God, he had no idea what was going to happen. And that's exactly what Christmas for Christ money does. It builds rooms like this all around America where a young person, a middle-aged person, an older person can go and say, you know what? I am going to build a room for God. Who could have known from that living room would come New Life Austin, 100,000 square feet. Who could have known from that living room would come the future general superintendent of the United Pentecostal Church. But when you give to Christmas for Christ and help us start more rooms like this, there's no telling what God can do when someone says, I will build a room for God. But the Bernard tells a story about one time when his church was in severe financial peril and a $20,000 grant for Christmas for Christ uh, is what kept his church going. Uh, and let me tell you something. Since that time, New Life Austin has given back over $200,000 to Christmas for Christ. They gave a lot more to other things too. I'm just talking about the CFC. That one church has given back over $200,000. So let me tell you something. As a financial person, I'll invest $20,000 in you building a room for God, and we get back over $200,000 to Christmas for Christ. But when you build a room for God, miracles happen. In America, we spent $465 billion on Christmas last year. That means an average was spent on every American of $700 on Christmas presents last year. So if your wife or husband did not spend 700 on you last year, they owe you this year. Add up what they spent last year and say, you owe me some money. You didn't spend $700 on me last year. Amen. And if in the United Pentecostal Church, if each one of our members would give $700 a Christmas for Christ, uh, amen, that would be over $500 million in one year. Last year, we gave $5.4 million Christmas for Christ, and we thank God for that offering. That was a record offering. But if every member of United Pentecostal Church uh, would spend the average amount that Americans spend on each other of $700, uh, that would be $500 million in Christmas for Christ. Just think how many more rooms we could build. We have $500 million to build it with. But you ask me, say, preacher, why is it so important to build a room for God? Let's go back to verse 13 in 2 Kings chapter 4. Amen. The man of God asked her one day, what is it that you need? See, when you build a room for God, you don't have to ask God for stuff. God asks you what you need. Uh, and she said, I have no need of nothing. Uh, but Gehazi spoke up and says, she has no child. Uh, she would love to have a child, uh, but her husband is old. Let me tell you something. Her problem of barrenness was not her fault. Uh, it was her husband's fault because he was old. Uh, so some things happen in your life is not your fault. Some of the abuse, some of the hurt, some of the pain of people did to you. When you build a room for God, it don't matter who put you in that position. It don't matter what people say about you. You just build a room for God. 
And the man of God said, you're going to have a child. And she said, don't lie to me. Don't lie to me, man of God. But lo and behold, she did have a child. But you go down, amen, to verse 18. The promise went to work one day with the father, that promised child I was giving to her, and fell and said, my head, my head. And the father said, take the child back to the mother. I always thought that was because, you know, in my house, mom fixes everything. Uh, but I believe the reason why that was, uh, she was the one that built the room. Uh, and when you have built a room for God and people know you built a room, people bring you problems. Uh, sometimes you wonder, everybody on your job, everybody around you, in your family, bring their problems to you. And you say, well, I got problems also. But it's because you built a room for God. They bring you the problems. Look at verse 20. The promise died. But look at where it died. Uh, it died on her knees. Promises will die in your life. But make sure when they die, you're still on your knees. It's so easy to stop coming to church. Uh, it's so easy to stop paying your tithes. Uh, it's so easy to stop believing when you're dealing with a dead promise in your life. Uh, a marriage that fell apart. Uh, a business that went bankrupt. A healing that didn't come. Answer the prayer didn't go like you want it to be. But let the promise die. But be on your knees when it dies. But look at verse 21. After the promise died, she picked up that dead promise, took it to the room she built for God, and laid him across the bed. One reason you must build a room for God is you must have a place to take a dead promise. Promises are going to die, and you need a place to take them. And the Bible says what? She closed the door. Let me tell you something. You can't tell everybody what's going on in your life all the time. So I mean to spend less time on Facebook with your problems and more time in the room for God with your problems. She closed the door and came down to her husband and said, Honey, I need to go see the man of God in verse 22. Verse 23 said, Why are you going? It's not a feast day. It's not Sunday. It's not Wednesday. When you haven't built a room for God, you don't have that intimate personal relationship. You can't wait for Sunday sometimes. You can't wait for Wednesday sometimes. I need God to do something and do it now. In verse 26, the prophet said, it's a well with you. It's a well with your husband, a well with your son. Uh, and she said, it is well. How could it be well with a dead promise laying across a bed? Let me tell you something. When you built a room for God, something inside of you says, it is well. It is well. It is well with my soul. I, I don't know how I'm going to make it. I don't know what's going to happen next. But it is well with my soul. It is well because I built a place for God and God's going to show up. He came back to the house, verse 32, and he found a dead promise on the bed. He shut the door. He prayed to Jehovah. In verse 34, he laid upon the child, prayed for the child. The child started sneezing and coming back to life. Miracle happened started to happen but verse 35 I find very interesting after the miracle started the man of God left the baby in the room and began to walk around the house to and fro I could see the wife like man of God get back upstairs I got a dead baby up there my boy is dead up there and you're in the kitchen you're in the dining room what are you doing down here and sometimes in your life you have a dead promise and God seems to be blessing other people and God seemed to be using you in other ways. And you wonder, so, but God, I got a dead promise in a room upstairs while you're walking around doing other things. Uh, but let me tell you, when God gets ready to do that work, uh, he's going to do a complete work. Uh, there are some other things that God needed to fix. Uh, I believe that husband already knew his, oh, his age is what caused her to be barren. And now he had caused the child to die. He was full of guilt. Uh, the wife was full of doubt because the promise was dead. Uh, I believe the man of God was saying, I'm going to fix some other stuff while I'm in here. And sometime when God's working in your life, but not in the place and the way you want him to work, just trust him. Let him keep walking to and fro. Let him fix everything while he's there. Then he went back to the room. Verse 36, I find it very strange. I would have thought he would have walked in a room by now the sun is sitting up, talking, looking good, and said, get up, son, and run downstairs and find mom. That's not what he did. He said, Gehazi, go find the woman and bring her here. Now, the last time she was in that room, a dead promise laid across the bed. And now she had to walk back up those stairs, put her hands on the doorknob of a room that a dead promise used to be in. And the hardest thing for us to do is to go back to a room when the last time we were there, the promise was dead. 
when the marriage seemed to be over, when the last marriage had failed, when the business is bankrupt, when the doctor's report is not good again, when you don't know how you're going to buy, pay for your next meal, you don't know if you're going to be evicted. You have so many dreams at one point of ministry and calling, and I'm going to help, and I'm going to do this, and, and walk up. But now all I have is a dead promise. And sometimes it's easier to stay busy in the house. Oh, we're still involved. Uh, we can still sing. Uh, we can still teach. We can even still preach sometimes. We can still usher. But deep down inside, there's a pain because there's a dead promise. Some of you husband and wife have dead promise you don't even talk to each other about. There's a wall between you because of the dead promise in a room that is still too painful for you to even be honest enough to even talk about it. But she had to walk back to that room. And say, the last time I was here, this room that I built for God held the dead promise. And I have to walk back in this room and open this door again, not knowing what's going to be on the other side of the door. But I came to talk to some people today who by faith has been running from God because of a dead promise in your life. Because of some hurt, because of some pain, because of some things you don't want to talk about. Uh, you know, kind of like Lazarus said, don't open that stone. By now he's stinking. He's a stinking dead promise locked behind that rock. Leave him in there. By now it's over. It's dead. He's done. He stinks. Uh, but we serve a God uh, that when you build a room for God and you dare to walk back in faith to the place where dead promise used to be, we serve a God that can build and bring a dead promise back to life. So I came to preach to two people today. Some of you have not yet built a room for God. Huh? And I come to challenge you to say it's time for you to repent of your sins, uh, be baptized in water in the name of Jesus, uh, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, and before you leave here today, you can talk to one of the pastors, and they can help you know the steps it takes to build a room for God. But I come to preach to some other people today about a dead promise. The people today that have been through some things that's been hurt, dealing with pain that you don't want to talk about. Uh, but when you build a room for God, you can stand in faith and say the same God that brought me through before will bring me through next time. Uh, let's look at 2 Kings chapter 8. The man of God came to the house one day and said, you got to leave all of this. Leave the house. Leave the land. Leave the room. Take your husband. Take your son. And sojourn the best place you can. Be homeless. For seven years, and she had to leave for seven years. But when the seven year ended, the Bible says her and her son came back because she said, I'm going to go back and get the room. I'm going to go back and get the land. I'm going to go back and get the fields. And, you know, I've often wondered in those seven years, she must have got a new job. In those seven years, she had built a new place to stay. But there was something inside of her said, I'm going back to the place with the promise. And sometimes it's so easy to settle and living to where we had to run away to in the midst of the famine. But she said, I'm going to go back to the place. And she, her plan was to go to the king with her sob story. But much to her surprise, as she was going to the king, uh, the king was going to Gehazi, the servant, and said, tell me some of the miracles that Elisha did. Uh, and Gehazi said, let me tell you about this woman uh, that built a room, uh, and her son died, uh, and Elisha prayed, and the son came back to life. And as the woman walked up to the king, Gehazi said, here is the woman, here she is right now. She did not know because of her room, because of her faithfulness, because of her faith that God was already fighting her battle. She didn't have to plead her case. She had to beg her case. She was homeless for seven years. She had lost everything, but because she came back to the room she built for God, God was already giving her favor. God was already making a way. God was already had her testimony go before her. Let me tell you something today. When you find yourself in a trial and tribulation, stay faithful to God. Keep believing. Keep trusting. Keep doing right. It's no time to give up. It's time to say, I'm going to trust the God that I serve, and I'm going to go back to the room I built for God. And the king said, give her back her land, give her back her house. And as a matter of fact, the seven years that she has been gone, give her back all that fruit. Because Joel said, I will restore to you the years of locust that's eaten, the canker worm and the caterpillar and the palmer worm. My great army I send among you, and ye shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. Because why? If you build it for God, God's always, God's always going to show up. 
You can put back up the picture of my church, if you don't mind, uh, on the screen. Uh, in June of 2017, it's the year, the month of my life, where you add all other years of my life together. I have more betrayal, more things, more things happened to me. And my family was worried about me because it seemed like after after another bad news after bad news after bad news after bad news uh, and it got to a point on a Saturday night I got an email amen from a former business partner that says you know what I've shut everything down in, in your business I've canceled the credit cards I've closed the bank account I've canceled the gas cards and late on a Saturday night my wife said what are you going to do I said I have no idea I got people coming to work Monday morning don't even have money to put gas in the truck payrolls this Friday I have no way to cover payroll so what are you going to do Saturday night I I had no idea it seemed to be over. Uh, but Sunday morning, I had one thing to do. I'm going to go to the room I built for God. When you don't know where to go, that's why you got to build a room. So when you don't know what to do, that's why you got to build a room. And I walked in that day, and one of my guys handed me a handwritten envelope. I just threw it on my desk of my office. They didn't even open it. It didn't look important. Uh, and after church, I went through it. It was like three different addresses. It was like a game. But inside that envelope uh, was one of the biggest checks uh, my business had ever received. Uh, it had been mailed three weeks ago from a customer I had for five years and they mailed it to absolutely wrong address that wasn't mine. Every other payment for all those years had been direct deposit but this one check was mailed and the Lord had it stuck in the mail, amen, for three weeks uh, and as a matter of fact the same Saturday that I got the email and did not know what I would do is the same Saturday that a three week old check was delivered with an answer to all of my problems and that's why I tell you, if you're building, if you're building, he will come. And when the promise is dead, when a marriage is over, when a business has failed, when the doctors say they have no hope, you must have a place that you built for God. As we're standing together right now, I've come to challenge you today. It's Christmas for Christ Sunday. Every head by every high clothes. There's some of you that can only afford to give $10, $20, $100, and that's fine. But there's some in here that could give a thousand, five thousand, ten thousand. You could give more. Amen. Because all we're appealing to you today is help us to build some rooms for God. If you would give and support Christmas for Christ, we will fund the next David Bernard in a room with his wife, with 10, 12 people sitting around a table. Doesn't look like much with some time when you're building a room. It starts from little when you're building a room. Uh, but I've learned just build it. Uh, just build it. Uh, just build it anyway. If you build it, he will come. So we ask and challenge you as you fill those cards out, those of you online and in service today, make up your minds. I'm going to invest uh, to build some rooms for God. Uh, but today in your life, as I said, if you've not yet built a room, we're not going to come to the altar. But before you leave here, find one of the pastors and say, I need to build a room. I need to build a room. I need a place for me. I need a place for my family. I need a refuge to go to. I need a place to know I built for God. So when promises die, I got a place to go. And to the rest of you today, every head by every eye closed, some of you have some dead promises you've been running from. And it's hindered your walk with God. Because you're mad at God. Because as he, the man of God was walking through the house to and fro, was a dead promise upstairs. And some of you have been scared to go back to that room. But I come to challenge you today. God will restore everything you've lost. But you by faith have got to go back to that. What would have happened when her son was alive upstairs? And Gehazi said, man of God says, come back to the room. No, I can't go back to that room. I won't go back to that room. I refuse it. It was so painful. Last I was in that room, my baby was dead on the bed. I could never go back there. If she had refused to go to the room, she would have never known the miracle that had been performed. And I come to challenge some people today with some of your hurt and some of your pain that you've been going through. It's time to go back to the room. We serve a God. This, this year, pandemic. APC had the best financial year ever. That's, that doesn't make sense. How's that possible? It doesn't make economic sense. When you build a room for God, economic sense doesn't matter. Medical sense doesn't matter. Legal sense doesn't matter. Your environment you're raising doesn't matter. The mistakes you made, does, none of that matters because you built a room for God and God showed up. And some of you today, God's calling you back to that room, back to that place, back to the place you've been running from. You'll never be whole. So you walk back to that room. Some of you marriages, you need to go back to some room. Some of you, been, some of you have talked about stuff that happened. Someone hurt. You need to open up 
See, God wants to be inside the wall, I told you. You got God in the basement somewhere. Your husband and wife don't even know where your room is. You, you, you've been hitting it, hiding it so long. It's time to bring the, bring the room up, put it on the wall, and say, God, I'm open to you. I built it for you. I know you're coming. I know you'll make a way. I, I'm trying to fix it, but I can't fix it. But I built it. And God will come. Come on, let's pray. Heavenly Father, right now, we come to you, Lord Jesus. Yes. All Jesus we can do is name. build the room Jesus and name. allow you to come. We can't yes. fix it. We can't do it. But we can build it in Jesus' name. Yes, yes. Go ahead, church. Let's build the room. Those of you online, those of us here, come on, let's build that room, Lord. We send our prayers. We call that name Jesus right now. Hallelujah. Thank you for every promise. Thank you for every promise. Thank you for every promise. Thank you for the living promise. Thank you for the answers that we've received in recent months and days. But God, I give you thanks for a promise that may seem that it is not alive right now, but we trust you, oh God. We're building a room right now. We're building a room of faith. Come on, all over this house and in every house and in every place that is watching right now. We build it, Lord. We build it by faith, oh God. This is our part to do, we know. And we know if we do our part, you will do yours and you will show up. You will show up. You will show up to a prayer, pray to a meal, fasted, to an offering given, whatever you're calling upon us to do. Help us, O oh Lord, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, there's some tools in our hand right now. Not only build your own room, but help somebody else right now. Help somebody else right now. Pray for someone else right now, Lord. You know exactly, you know exactly what they need, Lord. You know better than we know, and we may have several details. But, Lord, you know even deeper and better, oh, God. Yes, we can only see it through human perspective. But you see it through a divine, eternal perspective that sees every aspect. Not only have I filled this service with my word as my man gave you and delivered my message, but I have filled your life with my word. The words that you have heard spoken today, take those in. Receive that word. Receive those prophetic promises. Receive the declaration of the miraculous and provision that you have heard today. Receive that from my word like you will take in the food into your body today. And if you will, you are going to be fulfilled in a way that your own capacities could not fill you. You have tried to plan out and think out the solution and the problem. But if you will eat my word today, it will be the fulfillment of what is needed, saith the Lord. Hallelujah. I receive your word, God. I receive this word today. That's it. Go ahead. I know many of you have heard hundreds of sermons, but God wants you to eat this slice of bread today, right now. God, you, you meant it for us. It was more than just another sermon, Lord. It was our nourishment for today. It was our necessary food for today. Oh, I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. The Lord has encouraged us to go back to rooms where dead promises, and it is a fearful thing. What am I going to find? What am I going to hear with another ring of the phone? You know, our cell phones 
being able to see the number that's that's good in a lot of ways but here's one way it's not so good if you're waiting for a report and things are hanging in the balances with a life when you see that number we feel like she may have felt oh my I don't know if I want to answer that call I don't know if I want to go to that room but if we'll go ahead and go to the room that you have built you've built it with your faith you have been faithful you have prayed you have trusted God you have acted on messages such as we have heard before you go ahead and act on it and I know there there can be a fear that comes but I feel like the Lord really really wants us to deal with those past promises that may not have been answered and may not be as alive as we would like to see them now or may just totally be dead let's just call it what it is but there is a God who is a miracle worker not only can he create life he can resurrect life and he's a healer and a creator and a life giver let's praise him together right now let's really praise him yes we do Lord because you're in control we have something to praise you about yes yes situations and conditions they are not the basis of our praise right now our praise is based on you and who you are and then Lord I know that there are many good things that you have in store and that you are placing at our disposal hallelujah 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 he is a faithful God and he is going to come through and he's going to show up and he's going to show up right on time right on time thank God thank you brother and sister Stewart for being with us today